about 480 million years old. The Appalachian Mountains are a monumental natural barrier in eastern North America. It's a vast landscape that may just hide the darkest of secrets. Wild animal attacks, missing people, unsolved deaths. The Appalachians are no stranger to horror. So, I hope you enjoy these allegedly true horror stories from the Appalachian Mountains. If you have a scary story of your own, share it with us at darkstories.org. I'm looking for stories from the Rocky Mountains or stories from the Ozarks. Also, if you prefer to listen hands-free, follow the Darkness Prevails podcast on Spotify or iTunes, and leave us a review on iTunes too if you can. Thank you. Now, let's begin. I saw something on the New River. From Spirit. This happened a few years back. It was the middle of summer in Virginia in the New River Valley. I was coming home from a party. I had just dropped my sister off at her car and was heading home. I decided to take the river road back to my father's. My town is located in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains. I've lived here for 25 years now, and I know the area, and I'm used to the animals around here. One time, there was even a black mountain lion years back. But this story, it honestly makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I feel so uncomfortable just talking about it. Anyway, I crossed the Eggleston Bridge to go down to the river. Then I crossed the railroad tracks to get onto the gravel road. The night was clear, the sky covered in stars as the moon was new that night. The lights from the trailers on the other side of the river lit up the water. I was listening to 94.9 on the radio, relaxing as I had my hand out the window. Traveling halfway down the river, I began to grow slightly uneasy. I looked around as I drove and saw nothing out of the ordinary. Thinking it was my nerves from a few beers I'd had a few hours before, I pulled my hand in and rolled up the window. In doing so, a strange fog began to cover the road ahead. It was honestly too thick at times to see the road, so I had to go slower than I normally would, making me feel even more uncomfortable. As I cut through the first section of fog, a large mass in the road caught my eye. I hit the brakes as I came to a slow stop. I turned on my high beams to illuminate the road ahead, and I saw a large black dog. It looked to be the height of a full-grown German shepherd. Its fur was as black as the night sky. At first, I didn't think anything weird about it, until I noticed it would not look my direction. It wouldn't even acknowledge my car. Slightly annoyed, I honked my horn at it. As I did, it moved into the brush closest to the water. I kept on driving, feeling a bit freaked out but not necessarily scared. I was thinking it was someone's dog that got loose or was free roaming. In the middle of the mountains, a lot of people don't chain up their dogs. As I passed where the dog had disappeared to, I couldn't help but feel like it was there watching me drive by. I paid this feeling no mind. I believed I was just trying to scare myself over nothing. That was until I made it to the end of the road. Now, at the end of the river road is a small tunnel you have to blow your horn at so people know you're coming. And with that fog, I thought it would be best to flick my lights too just in case someone was racing down the road, jamming out. That is quite common as the river road is a hot spot for late night cruising. As I pulled up to the tunnel, I flicked on my high beams, and there I saw the same dog in front of my car again. I, I slammed on my brakes, making my tires skid slightly in the gravel. I looked at the dog as I turned off my music, feeling a strong, tense feeling in the air. I turned off the radio as I watched it. It did nothing but stand there. Getting annoyed, I went to blow my horn at it again, 
until it turned to face me. This would be the first time I'd actually see the dog's face, and it did not look like a dog. Its eyes were a bright red, its top canine stuck out from its muzzle. I froze with a heavy feeling of dread washing over me. I was petrified, as if I knew I should not move. I don't know how long I was sitting there, but a call from my sister snapped me out of my trance. Quickly, I picked up the phone and continued to watch the dog. Hello? Hey, girl. I was calling to check on you, and also to have you tell my girlfriend that I was with you. My sister said over the line as I could hear her girlfriend commenting in the background. It took me a moment to respond as I couldn't take my attention off the creature in front of me. Uh, yeah, yeah, you were with me, but, um... Before I could say anything else, her girlfriend screamed at her to get off the phone after hearing my answer. I tried to get her to stay on the line, but sadly she hung up before I could tell her what was happening. I stared at the dog still, and yet it was closer now. I hadn't even noticed it had moved. Quickly... I put my car into reverse, ready to speed off if I had to. But it didn't come any closer. It just stood there between me and the tunnel. It tilted its head slightly as if it was curious about what I was doing. It felt like I was sitting there for hours when it had only been 20 minutes. And as quickly as the dog appeared, it vanished into the thicket closest to the river. Once it disappeared, I sped away, not caring about the potholes or the fog blocking my vision. I just knew I had to get away from the river. I had to get away from that... dog. Speeding down the road, I looked around, trying to make sure whatever that was, wasn't chasing me. Once I got home, I took a breather to try to calm myself. It was now 2 a.m., I kept quiet as to not wake my father. I read up on a few things, and I think what I saw was a hellhound. It is said that if you see a hellhound three times, it may just lead you to your death. Reading that made my hair stand up on end. When you really think about it, I saw that dog two times. So, who's to say when the third time is going to come for me? It's been six years since that night, and I haven't seen another dog like that, so I honestly don't know what to think. But sharing this story helps relieve some of the strain, and maybe someone can help me understand why I saw this thing. Specifically, why I saw it two times in such a short amount of time. Tales from a Forest Ranger from Mare Bear. I used to work as a forest ranger outside the small town of Blacksburg, Virginia. It's one of many tight-knit communities that dot the line drawn by the Appalachian Mountain Range. In the four years I had that position, I received my fair share of odd calls, but what I'm about to tell you is pale in comparison to anything else I've experienced. My story contains moderate depictions of animal violence, so if you don't like that subject matter, I'd advise you to skip ahead. It first began on Tuesday. That was the first day of the week I was on duty. I remember I was sat down at my desk of the ranger post a quarter of a mile or so in the woods, drinking coffee. I was usually tasked with the maintenance of the trails surrounding the nearby camp area and enforcing bland regulations regarding firearm discharge and the likes. That's why it was surprising when a young couple stumbled into the building. The man, dirty, covered in ash with clothes torn, and the woman in similar condition. They asked me for some help. The request that me and the other ranger on duty, Trevor, granted. We were confused as to why they came to the station, rather than calling either of us or emergency services to request first aid. I remember the woman distinctly. She had a stark English accent, 
She told us that they were both so caught up in running, they didn't even think about making a call. That made me and my partner raise an eyebrow, but we let them continue as we disinfected their wounds and applied rather amateur bandaging. As she alleged, they were on a hike away from camp when they were attacked by what they described as a walking tree. I was as confused as you probably are now. I think I laughed a little as I heard what she said. Trevor was the first to try to place a realistic lens over their story. You ran into a tree? No, no, it attacked us, it was moving. The woman was very passionate as she argued, but her boyfriend calmed her down a little after he saw the subtle looks of disbelief we wore. My only supposition at the time was that they maybe ran into a thicket of brambles without realizing it. Their wounds were very real, though, and appeared to have been inflicted by an animal of some kind. But there were no distinct bite or claw marks. I couldn't line it up with the typical predatory wildlife we saw around our area. Regardless, we let them file a report, if you could call it that. About an hour later, I escorted the couple back to their campsite and ensured they retrieved all their belongings safely. Something to note, these parks have communal camping areas. Generally, you pitch a tent in a circle all around a central clearing, where six or seven other groups are situated. Oddly enough, though, we did see other people out and about, but not one came to ask what the issue was. If anything, they were quiet, and tried to keep out of my way the best they could juxtaposed to the usual happy and friendly campers I meet out there. Under normal circumstances, we would have investigated the area for the predatory animal that the couple was attacked by to ensure there weren't any wildlife getting all too friendly with humans. However, they were so turned around, the best localization they could give us was a direction. Given that, and the ridiculous description of the assailant, we never followed up. The rest of Tuesday passed uneventfully, aside from me having to talk to an intoxicated fella who was urinating all too publicly. Fast forward to Wednesday. It's 11 or so in the morning, a decent chunk of time into my shift. Our outpost gets a call. An older male with a raspy voice informs us that this campsite is filled with daddies. He clarifies that there's a whole bunch of dead animals in and around his fire pit before telling us, You'd better hurry. Yeah, I know. A weird call. Fearing the worst, I headed down to the camp area, which happened to be the same one that the couple from yesterday was situated at. I arrived unsure of what to expect. I met the guy outside his RV. Lo and behold, all around us were dead animals. There were at least 15 of varying species. Rabbits, squirrels, birds too. As I recall, the biggest thing there was a coyote, which was taking his final sleep just outside the clearing. None of them had any visible injuries. What was odd, though, was the slight layer of soot that seemed to cover the coat of each animal, staining them in even shade of gray. I remember touching the coyote only to find the ashy residue on my fingertips. I had to call in to administration. Obviously, something was very wrong here. I believe they told me they were dispatching a team to conduct a water test to check for contamination. In the meantime, we had to clear out all the other campers, including the guy who reported it. I remember one hippie-type dude really well. As I was telling him why he had to go, I offered that there was another campsite just a mile or so north. He told me something along the lines of, Nah, dude, I'm just gonna go back home. There's something real wrong with this place's mojo. Despite that campsite being closed, we still serviced the local trails, so I was back on duty the next day. It was almost entirely uneventful. We spent much of the early morning resorting our documents before it came time for my rounds. The walk from our station to the campground was boring, with no fresh litter to collect, given there were no people. When I finally got to the camp area, it struck me as lonely, almost like a ghost town. 
since it was the first time in my career we had to close during a normally busy season, it felt very strange. I lapped the center of the camp area, not bothering to check out each individual site, before I headed back up another path, one that ran almost parallel to the one I came down. That's when I started to pick up a strange smell. It was like charcoal burning, but hotter, if that makes any sense. It almost stung to inhale. Since there weren't supposed to be any campers nearby, I decided to follow it. I seemed to be getting closer as I walked down the path, judging by smell alone. And the further I went, the more acidic the smell became. At that point, I had no clue what could have been producing it. I had to cover my face with a cloth in typical bandit fashion, though it helped very little. Maybe 600 yards down the path from the campground, I finally made it. It was this ball of what looked like wood. About a foot in diameter, it sat in front of me squarely in the middle of the path. Off of it came this silver smog, sifting eight feet into the air before it dissipated. Getting closer, it began irritating my eyes. Noticing the thing was under direct sunlight, I gave it a hefty kick with my boot, causing it to roll a few feet down the path. What was very odd was, as soon as it hit the shade, it instantly stopped smoking. It just sat there, a charred ball of wooden facsimile. But it wasn't wood. Wood doesn't burn in the sun, after all. I left it there on the path and walked back to the station. The smell faded pretty quick. Anyway, as soon as I got in, I grabbed Trevor. He set the station phone to forward to his cell phone. We both then grabbed shovels, going to find the object in hopes of burying it. Bad practice for both of us to leave the post, I know, but he was real curious to see what it was. Only, as we arrived where I left it, the thing was gone. The only trace that remained was the slightest acidic tinge in the air but no smoldering ball. It was pretty big, so whatever took it had to have been large itself. Thursday wrapped up with no further events. Then came Friday. Still waiting on the administration to clear the campsite fit for use again, it ran as slow as the day before. Nothing at all happened during the day. Right as I was clocking out, though, as the afternoon blended into the evening, a family came into our station. There was the mother, the father, and a little boy, maybe nine years old. To be honest, I don't remember my conversation with them nearly as well as with the couple from before. But to sum it up, they told me that they had been walking their dog on a nearby trail maybe an hour earlier, before it took off barking at something in the woods. They kept stressing how it never behaved like that, and they were eager to find it considering how low the sun was getting. So I agreed to help. Trevor said he'd follow up with me after the late shift arrived at the post. They told me they lost him about a quarter mile or so from the station. Yet again, I found myself walking back to the same campsite. After asking if he responded to a name, they told me he did. I think it was Rufus or Roger or some other generic canine title. I think the mother and the kid split off in one direction towards the station, while me and the dad went the other way toward the campsite. We called the dog's name every 15 seconds or so, and as a pet owner, my heart sank a little every time there was no response. The father got serious with me, and asked how likely it was he'd run into a predatory animal out here. He told me the dog was a big Alaskan Malamute, and I told him that a mountain lion probably wouldn't mess with a dog like that unless it was protecting its young. I remember mentioning that a bear could take it on, but he doubted the dog would be stupid enough to challenge a bear. Regardless, bears really weren't too frequent at the base of the mountains. I was going to mention the suspected tainted water, but I decided against it, as it was on the far side of the campsite, so it could worry him unnecessarily. Maybe half an hour into our search, the mom called the dad. She told him they hadn't found anything and the dad told her that we were still looking and said if they didn't find him within the next half hour, 
they'd meet back up at the station and call it a night. I felt real bad after that. Then I called the dog's name as loud as I could. All of a sudden, way to our right, in the direction of the campsite, we heard this crashing. Suddenly, that gorgeous dog burst through the undergrowth, running up to his owner and ignoring me. He was moving quick, but with a limp. Further, the white parts of his coat seemed to be stained gray, just like the animals from the clearing. The owner hugged the dog, wiping what seemed to be ash off on his pants. He asked me if I knew what the residue was, but I told him I had no clue. From the direction the dog came from, there was a second wave of crashing. It came closer to us and seemed to stop altogether a few feet into the thicket of trees. The sun was close to setting, but there was still enough light to see decently. Behind the trees, we made out a very strange shape. It seemed tall and thin. As we watched it move, there was this thick crackling sound, almost like a fireplace. It took one step towards us, and the guy, now holding his dog, shouted, Hey! That caused whatever the figure was to immediately bolt the other direction. As we heard more of that crackling and underbrush being pushed aside, we picked it up pretty quick, speed walking back to the outpost. The dog's leg was injured, but it was in good spirits and limped along with us. Strangely enough, I picked up a little of that burning smell from before. I asked the guy if he smelled it and he said yes telling me it was like someone was having a bonfire. The night wrapped up with the couple meeting back up. The smile on the kid's face as he hugged the furry beast that was bigger than him really made my night. Trevor met me outside the outpost, and after filing a quick report, we did the 20 or so minute walk back to the parking lot together. Luckily, the night shift guys were real nice and did most of the overhead paperwork for us. On the walk, I told him about the figure we saw and the weird crackling sounds. He told me he never saw anything like it before. He asked if I think that's what the dog ran after, and I said something along the lines of, maybe. That was one huge dog, and that thing out there was not a bear. So what kind of animal was it? Trevor was as confused as I was. Saturday finally came my last day on duty until next Tuesday. I wasn't feeling great when I got there, only on five hours of sleep. Luckily for me, the nearby campsite still wasn't open, and the day droned on quick. I was snapped from my tired robotic work as our phone rang. Trevor picked it up. Listening for no more than two minutes, he told me he had to go. He didn't say anything beyond a family issue, and left hurriedly. To be frank, this ticked me off, considering I was tired as heck. But the shift was almost over, and I thought about skipping my rounds at the campsite that afternoon, but decided against it. After all, the fresh air of the walks was the only thing keeping me awake. I remember using a sharpie to craft a very poor Be Back Soon sign that I taped onto the station door as I went for my walk. It was really just a formality as I didn't expect anyone to come by within the 30 minutes I was gone. So down I went, back to the camping area. It was the middle of the afternoon, the sun still bright in the sky. It didn't stop me from feeling uneasy as I began to smell that all-too-familiar charcoal acid mix, though. It was modest as I worked my way down the path until I finally stepped foot into the clearing that's when I saw it. Surrounding the communal fire pit, there were seven large wooden tar balls, like the one I'd seen on the path before, only much larger. They were all smoldering in the sun. At that point, I was convinced some person was behind it. To what end, I had no idea. I called out into the clearing, slightly muffled by the bandana I had to put back on my face. Naturally, no response from anyone but dear God, did the air stink. So I decided to do what I did before. I made my way into the clearing and nudged the fuming mounds of wood and black material. It took me a good five minutes, 
I didn't want to touch them, and they were all heavier than the one before. I finally got them all out of the sun and into the shade. I stepped back a few paces to inhale fresher air. They gradually stopped smoking. Having no clue what to do, I opted to do another write-up back at the station, making sure to mention the geometric formation. As I turned around to leave, though, I noticed something was wrong. It's that feeling you get when something isn't quite right, but you're unsure what. I looked at the forest in front of me. Nothing seemed amiss at first. I scanned the tree line and then I saw it. Blended in with the wood of the trees much like a stick bug, there stood a man. At least what looked like a man. It was spindly and thin, maybe nine or ten feet tall. Its body seemed to be a black wooden texture, with its limbs and torso outlined a deep brown. I just stared at it, mouth agape. I think it was attempting to camouflage itself, and when it realized I noticed it, it began to move. Its head was much like a bulb, crafted out of similar material to its body, yet it had no discernible features. It slowly climbed off the tree and out of the undergrowth, moving towards me. I was paralyzed with fear as it moved. This ear-splitting, crackling noise played, much like the one from the incident with the dog. After an excruciating few seconds, it was standing about 15 feet away from me, in the middle of both paths back to the station. It was swaying back and forth as if doing some kind of dance. The smell of smoke and that unnatural burn weighed heavy in the air. It took a step towards me, and my heart was beating out of my chest. It took another, and another, and I still couldn't move. And then, with a great stride covering almost ten feet, it stepped right past me, as if I wasn't there. I turned instinctually and watched it, as it began picking up the strange, smoldering balls I had just moved. And, effortlessly, as if they weighed nothing, it placed them back into formation around the campfire. As I saw its focus shift from me, I regained control of my body and ran. I sprinted the whole way back to the outpost, entering it and slamming the door shut. I had no clue if the thing followed, it showed no interest in me, but still, I couldn't take a chance, so I gathered all my belongings locking the place up and then took off again this time to the parking lot, leaving the be back soon sign still hanging loosely on the door. As obvious as it seems, I never returned to that post. I was contacted numerous times by my superiors and Trevor, but never did respond. Eventually, a notice of termination arrived at my home. I don't believe I ever received my last paycheck either. Not that I care. Under no circumstance will I ever go back there. Call me a deserter or a coward, whatever you like. But know if you saw what I saw that day, and you saw the sheer inhumanity of that creature, you wouldn't go anywhere near that place. As far as I'm concerned, forests are strictly off limits to me now. You simply can't be sure what resides within. And the creature... Well, I really have no clue what it was up to. What it was doing with the weird spheres of whatever, I don't know. I have no doubt now that all the odd incidents I experienced that week were its doing, though. I'm just thankful it didn't kill me, because it very well could have. That about wraps up my week. I'll leave you with this, though. I did a modicum of research based on the creature's appearance, the only thing I found related to it was an old Dutch folktale that described a character known as De Tokmin, or the Tree Man. According to the tale, it was a thin being with appendages much like tree branches that would chase naughty children until they told their parents of their wrongdoing. Whether it was based off of the creature I saw or an innocently crafted bedtime story, I'm not sure. To be honest, I don't think I want to find out. Good luck to all the people working in forests out there, especially those along the Appalachians. Be careful and stay safe. 
Appalachian Trail Lights from Anonymous Hiker. I am a petite woman in my early 20s. I grew up and live in rural South Central Virginia, surrounded by dense woods for miles in every direction. I know what animals, birds, planes, satellites, planets, stars, etc. look like, act like, and sound like. Being no stranger to the outdoors my whole life, it was only a matter of time until I got into solo long-distance hiking, and even during the pandemic I still hike, albeit responsibly, whenever I can on the Appalachian Trail in the western part of the state. Being a petite young woman and always hiking alone, I do take necessary precautions. My family can see my location on trail via a navigation app, popular in the thru-hiker and section-hiker community. I carry pepper spray and a knife, and I always tell someone where I will be and update them on where I am and how the conditions are. Anyway, this took place in mid-June of this year, 2020. I had planned to summit the Priest Mountain hiking southbound on the Appalachian Trail, starting my hike around 1pm from the parking lot at the base of the mountain and reaching the shelter by 5.30 to 6pm taking my time as the sharp elevation increase paired with a busted knee would add to the challenge of summiting the notorious beast of a mountain. After a good, strenuous, uneventful hike past beautiful waterfalls, gorgeous viewpoints, and the occasional snake or squirrel, I summited. The flat, mile-long hike to the shelter was a welcomed gift. After the 4,000-foot-plus elevation increase I had tackled for over five grueling miles, once I arrived at the shelter, I set up my hammock, keeping the tarp rolled up in its snakeskin, strung up above my hammock as the forecast was predicting a beautiful warm night. I do my thing, eat some energy bars, refill my water bottle, typical boring camp chores, before turning in at around 8pm. Despite the challenges of the day, I couldn't sleep, so I stayed up on my phone talking to a buddy whom I had planned to thru-hike the AT with earlier this year, but we had to cancel due to the Rona. We're texting away, sending funny videos and whatnot until 10pm, when I notice a headlamp coming down the side path from the trail to the shelter. Cautious, I hunker down in my hammock and shine my headlamp in the stranger's direction so that whoever was there knew that I was well awake and that I saw them. In the morning, I found out it was a dude who got separated from his group. If I remember correctly, he was a retired cop going by the trail name 5 -O. I watch 5 -O hang his bear bag in a tree by the shelter and watch him set up his hammock on the opposite side of the campsite. Cool, he's harmless, I think to myself. And this was the case, but this story doesn't involve a person or people. This is about what happens next in the skies above. As mentioned before, I didn't have my tarp set up because it was a beautiful night, so I could see the stars and enjoy the nice weather. What I noticed first was that my cell service signal was beginning to act funny around 10.45pm. One moment I'd have LTE, then 4G, then 3G, roaming, no signal, and back to LTE. This cycle continued throughout the night until 4am. A moment later was when I noticed it. A few of the stars in the sky appeared to be swiveling and shining very dim, soft spotlights, which didn't reach very far, but it was obvious that these weren't stars. They also weren't airplanes or helicopters. I couldn't hear any audible noise and I'm 4,500 feet above sea level on top of a mountain, closer to any plane than someone on sea level. Assuming I was tired and therefore seeing things which weren't there, I kept watching fixating my vision between two branches of a tree, watching one of these weird stars do its thing, swiveling back and forth, shining its light. Then, all of a sudden, the sky turned bright red, then pitch black. Everything in the sky vanished. The woods went quiet. I attempted to text my mother out of fear that something was about to go down. Mom, I love you. There's something weird going on with the sky. The feeling that I shouldn't have seen what I just saw and that I was unwelcome quickly set in. Being familiar with the woods, I can tell when I've overstayed my welcome, 
but this was unlike anything I'd experienced in the outdoors before. The vibe I was sensing was mean, hateful, spiteful even. The messages I sent to my mother and to my buddy didn't go through until hours later, as my cell signal was still going through its weird cycle of no service. About five minutes later, the sky turned red again, and then went back to normal, with one huge difference. Half of the stars in the sky were missing. Not as if they changed positions in the sky, I know how the Earth rotates and changes the locations of stars and planets. I mean, half of the original stars I'd seen earlier were missing. I could still see notable planets, such as Venus, exactly as they were in the sky before this happened. Everywhere in the sky which had one of those weird swiveling balls of light was blank. The rest of the night I felt uncomfortable. So uncomfortable, in fact, that I pitched my tarp and slept with my pepper spray clipped to my sports bra. I could not get my mind off of what I just saw. It was very similar to a phenomenon I'd witnessed weeks before while driving home from the grocery store back home. I happened to look up at the sky, just as a stationary ball of light warp sped away at a pinpoint. That's the best way I can describe it, like in Star Trek, whenever the USS Enterprise goes into warp speed. It was exactly like that. No crazy colors, no weird shapes, nothing like that. In both of these instances, they were unassuming white, star-like balls of light. Getting back on track the next morning was uneventful. I ran into 5-0's group and we all hiked down the mountain together to our cars in the parking lot below. I refused to mention what I saw the night before until I got home and logged into Facebook to share photos of my hike. Well, the peaceful parts of it. One Facebook group I was in was called All Women, All Trails, and someone had made a post a few days prior asking us about our weird experiences on the trail. This just happened to appear right at the top of my newsfeed, so I shared the story which I have now shared with you, not thinking I would get a response. Thirty minutes later, I received an alert that someone had replied to my comment. The woman that replied claimed to live not too far from the Priest Mountain and shared a similar experience she had one night, as she, her husband, and their neighbors were having a bonfire. Granted, they were admittedly under the influence, but the parallels between my story and the experience she shared with me were described by her as weird. Apparently, that night when she, her husband, and their neighbors were having a bonfire, they all saw a bright red light shoot straight up into the sky from the direction of the mountain and felt the same discomfort I experienced. Interpret this how you will. I have nothing to gain from lying to strangers on the internet. I feel it's my duty to the hiker community to share my weird experiences in the Appalachian Mountains. I'm not the first, nor will I be the last, person to experience something weird. And this isn't even as insane as what other hikers have admitted to seeing or experiencing. If anyone else has experienced something weird on the Appalachian Trail, specifically in the Alto Wintergreen Resort area, please share your story. There's something weird going on in the skies above popular hiking trails, and it needs to be openly discussed.